The following contains strong opinions about the news media. Viewer discretion is advised. To get fucked. Welcome back to Ranked. I'm Charles. I'm McCurdy. And I'm Nathan. We've reached movie number two for Pierce Brosnan. Movie 18 overall this episode. We'll be finding a place for Tomorrow Never Dies in the ranked list below, which uh, I'm going to read in case people are just listening. Goldeneye, Goldfinger, From Russia With Love, License to Kill, The Spy Who Loved Me, The Man With The Golden Gun, Dr. No, A View To A Kill, For Your Eyes Only, Honor Majesty's Secret Service, Thunderball, Octopussy, The Living Daylights, Live and Let Die, Moonraker, Diamonds Are Forever, and You Only Live Twice Still At The Bottom. It's always fun to call that out. It's the movie that just, it's not like it's bad, it's just... I don't feel like it belongs there. I think it does. It's just <laughs> underwhelming. I don't know, man. Even Sean Connery didn't give a shit about it. Anyway, we say goodbye to Goldeneye, which became our new number one last episode. And then um, we get to the follow-up. I'm gonna... Yeah. Goodbye, Goldeneye, with your motivated action and post-Cold War characterization of James Bond. The spirit of Roger Moore is back for more in Tomorrow Never Dies, the movie about how news for profit is probably the greatest mistake humanity ever made. Because once corporations take over media outlets and get in bed with big government, they warp reality itself to spread ignorance and stupidity in order to manipulate and control populations of sheep-minded f***wads better known as you and me. <laughs> Where did you get? Did you know I was gonna go on a f***ing rant like this? Okay. We all know the news isn't about informing people, it's about entertainment. Anything other than weather and sports is a bunch of bullshit that's meant to cash in on the fallacy that if it's on TV, then it must be true. Wouldn't it be great if this James Bond movie fleshed out this concept of the real fake news via its story about a megalomaniacal media mogul starting a war just to sell copies of his newspaper? Sure, but then we wouldn't have time for explosions and titties. Who cares about truth or substance or meaning when it's all about entertainment, baby? But wait, maybe that's the point. Maybe there's some secret genius here, some kind of commentary on the dangers of one person or franchise having too much influence on the hearts and minds of billions of people. Maybe the over-the-top action is in fact the message. Maybe it's a big dumb action movie as allegory for how the mass media has been bought and sold and corrupted and warped into nothing more than a means to divide the people and distract us from our day-to-day -day debt slavery. Nah, this movie's about banging, drinking, f***ing shit up, and looking good while doing it. Give the people what they want. That's entertainment. The only substance I need is that Danish professor's ass. Or Terry Hatcher's ass. Or remote-controlled cars, which I assume were a big trend in the late 90s. I mean, this is a Bond movie, right? My name's Bond, James Bond. I'll have a vodka martini shake and not stir it. This is all we need to hear to know we're in the right place. And anything beyond that would hurt my brain. It's cool, sleek. It's the movie that looks like Bond, sounds like Bond. <laughs> consumes alcohol but never smokes like Bond. Runs, bangs, and shoots like Bond but is ultimately empty. As Dr. Dre once said, you've been found guilty of being a white bread chicken sh mother I concur, Doctor. This movie might taste good, but it's just empty calories. Something you eat not for sustenance, but purely out of boredom. For you buttheads out there always telling me you just want to turn your brain off and watch a big dumb action movie, look no further than Tomorrow Never Dies, you f <laughs> That's my rant. Okay, so you've just had a big hit with Goldeneye. You did the whole post-Cold War thing. So where do you go now? We'll get into that. Did you like and subscribe? Alex, was Nick Elwes, did you like and subscribe? So, Tomorrow Never Dies is the first Bond film to be titled something that has nothing to do with either the novels, the short stories, 
references to the James Bond mythos or Ian Fleming himself. The title was actually based off of a Beatles song. So another connection to the Beatles. Yet again. That's as bad as listening to the Beatles without earmuffs. 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 Ringo Starr, a.k.a. the man who would go on to marry a Bond girl. Shared bodily warmth. Just like you, McCurdy, Ringo Starr was notorious for just his misspeakings and just these odd things that he would say. And that's where the title came from. He was telling a story about how somebody snipped off a lock of his hair when he wasn't looking. And during that interview, that's when he uttered the famous phrase. I was talking away and then, <laughs> there it goes. And I looked around, there's about 400 people just smiling. You see. We had that in the other program. <laughs> You know, so you can't blame, you know, what can you say? What can you say? Oh, yeah. Tomorrow okay. never knows. <laughs> but it was originally titled Tomorrow Never Lies, which makes a lot more sense. Oh. However, sometime during production, a fax was sent and it was misspelled as, there was a typo, as Tomorrow Never Dies. Really? And the producers were like, dude, I like that title. It's so much better. And so they wow. changed it to Tomorrow Never Dies. Interesting. Tomorrow Never Lies makes more sense with the themes of the movie, but... If it was the smarter movie that I was kind of getting at in that intro, you know, this mm -hmm. movie is reaching to be smart, and it could have been, but at the end of the day, it's just a big, dumb action movie. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing inherently wrong with that. No. And it's kind of a guilty pleasure for me. I actually really enjoy this movie. Contrary to everything I just said, I really like this movie, but that doesn't mean it's no. smart. No. Tomorrow Never Lies was probably the version of the script that yeah. was smart. So I'll get into that. Speaking of the script, this film was had a lot riding on it due to the success of GoldenEye. So MGM wanted the film out by 97 to coincide with stock options that they were gonna have available at that time. That makes sense. You can just feel that this movie was rushed. That it was like, yep. we had six years of no bond and we had time to regroup and reconsider our approach and they <laughs> golden eye and then it's like Shh, we had we had a hit we got a cat we need to get something out we're like pierce we need you back right away and then yeah. uh, you know that shows more than anything not just with the somewhat lack of story and it's just all plot and it's a lot of uh, action but even something as simple as the uh, the sound is comical. The sound effects are from like a cheap library. Yeah. Waylon shoots a control panel and they use shitty sound effects of, of pottery breaking, which like our, our love affair with Red Letter Media, they use that sound effect all the time. That's why Nans and I pick up on it. Indy throws him the whip and it's like, hang on. Wait a minute, what was that? Was that the curler Nascar? There's even a moment where Bond uses his silenced pistol and they use the wrong sound effect. Every punch sounds the same. Every kick sounds the same. Maybe this is just the advantage of seeing this like 20 years later. Yeah. Maybe at the time that was new, but now those sound effects are funny. I heard one of these sound effects in the original ring, the Japanese ring, and yeah. it makes me laugh. I'll cut it in here. <laughs> is being punched and kicked with these funny sound effects that make me laugh and giggle and then and then Waylon wah and like pottery's breaking <laughs> as she's shooting a control but it's like it's goofy it's like they must have rushed where's golden eye i think a guy like martin campbell is like a no nonsense no bullshit i get my way i'm here to make the best movie on the fucking planet you're going to get original audio <laughs> And then Spotswood's like, I don't know, use a stupid sound library. I don't give a f 
Speaking of in this movie, that's terrible. The satellite shot where they used, they were like, let's go to space to see the new satellites. Yeah, okay, I know you're gonna say, Charlie, it's, it's, it's of the time. Yeah, that stuff doesn't factor into ranking. Again, to go back to Martin Campbell, he knew how to use CGI in a subtle way that isn't like putting it in your face, like right? Miniatures the Golden Eye like satellite is predominantly a miniature. Yeah, so it, and it stands works. the test of time. Whereas the Carver satellite just looks like a cartoon. It looks as cartoony as the man himself. In another movie, someone would have been taking that same CGI image and just used it as a demonstration. Oh, <laughs> this is the satellite. This is what it looks like up in space. And then it would have been like a shot of like our satellites. And then they would have showed like, oh, this is just a recreation. You know, like you see those on the news nowadays as if they're, they're or like uh, it's in a press kit where like NASA will release a press kit. And be like This is our new satellite. And this is what it's going to look like. Or this is our new Mars rover. This exactly. is what it's going to look like. And they'll they take the these CGI animations that look like that. animation. Yeah. And it looks great for that. But when you watch it and you realize, oh, oh no, this is supposed <laughs> to be what it actually is supposed to look like in space at this exact moment in the movie. This isn't somebody being like, this is the recreation. No, this is what it's supposed to look like. Yeah. It looks really really bad it's not the worst part of the movie but it definitely ages it to their credit they didn't go crazy with the cgi they no, it's they only, only that one shot i thought they only things. they only used it in one shot in the movie yeah I mean, there's other cgi of course but i know what you're talking about you're saying the entire shot is cgi they definitely use miniatures for all of the boats and stuff in the end of the movie for sure yeah. well if they did that why did they Use CGI for the space stuff. Did someone think, oh, yeah, it'll, it'll look like space stuff. You already had a satellite prop, you know, the $300 <laughs> yeah. million dollar thing. Be careful. It's worth $300 million. You break it, you bought it. Just take the satellite prop, take some video of it, and just put it in space. Why did you have to do CGI? It is a telltale detail of coming off of GoldenEye and rushing something out. MGM wanted the film out by 97 to coincide with the stock's options. And at the same time, treatments for the plot had originally involved British government handing over Hong Kong to China. Because remember, Hong Kong, the city, was owned by the British government before it went back to China. 97 was when Brit the British government was going to hand it back. So they wanted the film to kind of tie in with that. But then obviously those plans were pretty much scrapped. But you can tell that China was still involved in the script for this new film. Bruce Feinstein? Fernstein? It looks like Feirstein. Feirstein. Feirstein? Right? I never correct you anymore because I have too much fun making fun of you. <laughs> I haven't drank enough. Feirstein returns with the script based on this time, his time in journalism and his experiences watching the Gulf War on cable news. Director David Spotswood, and he was a writer on 48, 48 Hours Holy and directed... Dude! You pronounced a difficult last name I'm gonna perfectly. Get... When you got David wrong, it's Roger Spotswood, but... Go get f***ed. That was... Um, I'm so proud of you. <laughs> I hate you so much. So Spotswood, he was a writer on 48 Hours. It was like the biggest claim to fame he had before this movie. And then he directed a movie with Arnold Schwarzenegger after this, The Sixth Day. Uh, and he actually brought on Nicholas Myers, who you may or may not know was best known for the better Star Trek films to do rewrites on this movie, even though he's not credited. But all that being said, the script hadn't even been finished yet before they started filming. So that may answer some of your problems, Charlie, <sighs> and, yep. uh, with this movie. Yeah, that and go line up Martin Campbell's IMDb next to Mr. Spotswood's and you kind of see what we're in for here. Now, many people have made comparisons with Elliot Carver. Worldwide media ban. Able to topple governments with a single broadcast. And Rupert Murdoch of News Corp, a.k.a. Fox News. But Fernstein says he based the character off of a media mogul named Robert Maxwell, who's a British media proprietor, who had a very similar mm. death to the one M creates at the end of the film. Elliot Carver is missing, presumed drowned, while on a cruise aboard his luxury yacht in the South China Sea. For a movie about fake news, it's fun that Carver's death is then covered up with fake news. But that's how the yeah. British government works. The BBC is literally run by the government. They can say whatever the f they want. Why do you think James Bond himself says, I never believe what I read in the press anyway. It's because he knows that every secret mission he's ever gone on has been covered up in the press. But I also pointed out again, like this, the character was sort of based off of that. Like that a real British life 
guy, yeah, who died. Well, apparently the story was, I, I didn't read all into it, but apparently this guy who was a media mogul of some type in Britain, you know, he was also on Parliament at some point. He killed himself on his yacht. And when he, after he died, they found out there was a bunch of financial, like, he was basically stealing tons of money from his own company. Murdoch. And so, oh, wow. Murdoch? This wasn't Murdoch. This is, this is oh. Ian Robert Maxwell is the guy's name. Okay. But apparently they semi based him off of this character. Hmm. You can also see it's Randolph Hearst, but also maybe Rupert Murdoch, you know, maybe even Ted Turner in there. You know, it's a, it's an amalgamation. Wow. Elliot Carver was originally asked to be played by. Anthony Hopkins, but Anthony Hopkins turned it down to work on GoldenEye director Martin Campbell's movie, Mask of Zora, which is also a really great movie. Mm -hmm. And then, we, of course, we got Jonathan Price, who would make another Bond alum in Game of Thrones, because we've had several by this point. Thanks. And then we've got Terry Hatcher, at this time, was best known for playing Lois Lane on Lois and Clark, The New Adventures of Superman. Most people today, I think, know her from Desperate Housewives, but that's what she was known for in the 90s. She was three months pregnant when she began filming for the role, so her scenes had to be shot sooner rather than later. And she was also quoted for taking the role because her then-husband wanted to, or had always dreamed of being married to a Bond girl. Uh, let's see, who do we got? <laughs> Good for him. For as long as it lasted, good for him. Michelle Yao plays the first ethnic Chinese Bond girl. Because if you remember, in Dr. No, we had Miss Taro, and she was played by a British actress, but she's supposed to be Chinese. This was her first American role. She had done a bunch of Chinese films, some with Jackie Chan. And then she wanted to do her own stunts for this film, but Spotswood wouldn't let her because of the insurance. Because when you're doing a film like this, I mean, the insurance for Mission Impossible movies has got to be ridiculous yeah. for Tom Cruise to do all those stunts that he does. So he wouldn't let her do any of the stunts. However, she did get to do all of her own fight scenes. Pathetic. Of course, we get the return of JDB as Jack White. Because mm -hmm. can't get enough JDB. You free fall for five miles and use your oxygen or you'll die of asphyxiation. Sounds like my first marriage. Third wife. We have our first appearance of... Charles Robinson, who is MI6 Deputy Chief of Staff, played by Colin Salmon. And that's sort of a pseudo replacement for Bill Tanner because the actor who played Bill Tanner in the previous film couldn't come back. So they created this new character, Charles Robinson, who is, I guess, the second in command because Bill Tanner is the Chief of Staff. So he's the Deputy Chief of Staff. The film also introduces the Walther P99. Are you Walther? That's cute to get me one of these. Which replaced the Walther PPK until we get to another James Bond down the road. So they just decided they wanted to update the gun because they were like, oh yeah, we have the, Walter's got this new gun they wanted to promote. And it's, this movie's, we'll get into talking about this. This movie's very much a commercial. And then the title song for this film was originally composed by the film's composer, David Arnold, and a demo was recorded. However, the producers, of course, wanted someone who had mass appeal. So they had several entries of new songs and this is kind of par for the course for a lot of the new films and of course they picked Sheryl Crow's song but you can hear his original song at the end of the film which is interesting because that song at the end is the end one's better <laughs> the lyrics go harder I mean I I do like the Sheryl Crow one and I think it you know it, it fits it's that very 90s well. and I like I, I like yeah, the Sheryl Crow I, I dig one. it it doesn't go I remember I like my songs to go hard I like to get into the movie hard but what I find so interesting about this one is that it sounds as if it's being sung from the perspective of Paris darling I'm killed I'm in a puddle on the floor waiting for you to return darling you won it's no fun martinis girls and guns it's murder on our love affair. This job of yours. Oh, it's murder on relationships. The one at the end, though, is like, the news is fake. It controls your mind. The news is that I am in control. And I'm like, that's my shit. <laughs> I, like, I, like, I like that. If you don't read the newspaper, you're uninformed. If you do read it, you're misinformed. Hmm. Mm, uh, so what do you do? That's a great question. <laughs> what is the long-term effect of too much information? 
one of the effects is the need to be first, not even to be true anymore. So what a responsibility you all have to tell the truth, not just to be first. Tomorrow's news today. But to tell the truth. We live in a society now where it's just first. Who cares? Get it out there. We don't care who it hurts. We don't care who we destroy. We don't care if it's true. Just say it. Sell it. Anything you practice, you'll get good at, Inclu including BS. I believe that. <laughs> the one that. at the end is played throughout you the know? movie, too, right? In the intro <laughs> Yeah, movie. where's the <laughs> give, <laughs> give me what? Give me that. <laughs> I really wanted Nance. I should, Nance, I should have called you and be like, dude, I need you to make a yeah. tinfoil hat. So every time Charlie <laughs> says something bullshit. You just put your tinfoil hat it on. It doesn't matter what your politics are. The news is for entertainment. If it bleeds, it leads. You you are a fucking night crawler. You should know this. This is this is true. There's no news. Like bad news. Well, Charlie knows how I now feel about the news. Not to bring up GameStop again, but <laughs> Yeah, we haven't we haven't updated our GameStop talk in a <laughs> while. But yeah, like that's that was what was so fun about GameStop was all these people are like can you believe they're lying on the news? I'm like, oh, uh, uh-huh, uh, 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 uh. <laughs> oh, you oh, you they're lying. lying. Money Penny, take this release. Young YouTuber Charles Myers has been found dead after speaking out against media corruption. He was found with his balls ruptured after being beaten mercilessly with a rope. Ah! Yeah! Anyway, we're pretty sure it was suicide. Anyway, we get producer Michael G. Wilson who makes a cameo. Mr. Wallace, call the president. Tell him if he doesn't sign the bill lowering the cable rates, we'll release the video of him with a cheerleader in the Chicago motel room. Inspired, sir. And after he signs the bill, release the tape anyway. Consider him slimed. We didn't mention this before because each of his cameos are really small and insignificant, but this one, this is the first time that he legitimately has several lines. He had a line in License to Kill and some of the previous films as like over voiceover and things like that. Yeah, you but this is almost like a voice. scene. This is his biggest cameo to this point. So, and, and as just a review, Michael G. Wilson was Cubby Broccoli's stepson who became producers on many of these films, but he also wrote, and we've joked that his writing style is very convoluted. He likes his plots to make no goddamn sense. He just comes <laughs> up with crazy ideas, doesn't put down the whiskey, he just writes some bullshit, yeah. and then it gets on screen. Diamonds and nukes but you know what? from this country Charlie, exchanged for that. Charlie considered him slimed. Considered, considered him, him slimed. Sli yeah, we've, we've slimed considered him quite him slimed. a bit. We have, uh, but we still love we like him. like him. We still but yeah, considered him yeah. slim. He he is the man. Like he is the man. He has tons of cameos in a lot of these movies. He's kind yeah. of the Stan Lee of the James Bond franchise because yeah. he's in every almost every movie. He's apparently also in Goldfinger, but it was when he was a teenager. You can't really tell if it's him or not. But then there's some that it's like, oh yeah, that's definitely him. Anyway, question for you, Nance. Did you spot someone's cameo? Did you see a, a special little boy toy of yours? Of mine? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I have no idea what you're talking about, so I guess no, I missed it. Did you spot this is Sparta? We're now down 14 degrees by the scale. No. Oh, this man. is sinking! That's basically what his line is. <laughs> uh, Gerard Butler. Why is he my boy toy? <laughs> I don't know. But, you but, know you love him. <laughs> okay, fine, he's my boy toy. Bitch! I love you! Gerard Butler makes a on-screen appearance in this film as one of the, in the very beginning of the movie, as one of the sailors on the boat. Now, you might think this is his first role, I but thought it's it was. Not. I thought this was his first movie. It's not his first movie. His first movie was a movie called Mrs. Brown. Okay. And guess who also is in Mrs. Brown? Roger Moore. No. Pierce Brosnan. Pierce Brosnan. Nope. Spotswood. Nope. Michelle, yo. Judy Dench. Judy Dench. Yeah. So Judy Dench, there's like a part of me in my own head cannon which is like Judy Dench got him that role. Last trivia tidbit I want to throw out there is that this movie came out the same year as Austin Powers. Oh, which is what? good to note because it's no different than when the Casino Royale parody film came out. And then remember, that's what made George Lazenby want to leave the franchise because he's like, oh, now it's just a parody hello, hello. of itself. Hello, Mr. Powers. 
Care to have a little fun? Care to have a little fun? I have to save the world. This movie is basically a return to the Roger Moore era, coupled I, I, with 90s big action movies. I right? would say there's there's some Connery in this movie. Initializing launch sequence T, minus five minutes and counting. T, minus five minutes and counting. Three minutes and counting. One minute and counting. Activate defenses. Activate defenses. Close the shutters. you this nance what did you think of this movie i enjoyed it <laughs> but like when it's I, an like, enjoyable movie it's it's hard I, like, I do like this movie it's hard to not like this movie if you actually analyze like the movie and the plot and the bad guy and what's going on it's not a great movie you can tell that the script went through different revisions carver just needed to pick a lane and go for it but instead it's mm -hmm. like every scene it's as if his motivation is Switching. His motivation is literally, I want to get the broadcasting rights to China so I can have broadcasting rights to the entire world and, you know, make more yeah, money. Yeah, that's all I got out of it. And it was just like, that's the motivation of our bad guy for the movie? Yeah. But it's really fun. There's a lot of great action in it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I agree. Which goes back to, like, we, we kind of struggle through this every time, right? Where it's like, it's cool and it's sleek and it's sexy. Uh, overall, it doesn't really mean anything. It just defines yeah. the term <laughs> yeah. guilty pleasure because all the Bond stuff is there and the plot is, there are a couple plot holes we'll talk about, but overall, it's very easy to follow. It's not like Octopussy. It's no. not like The Living Daylights. And, and that's where this movie is going to be hard to place because it doesn't have those downsides. Right. It's very yeah. simple and straightforward, but it's so simple and straightforward that it just becomes big, dumb action movie where instead of doing smart stuff, like, hey, let's just pump the brakes for a second. Let's sit with the bad guy and let's get into his head and all that. He's just a big cartoon butthead. And a billion people around this planet <laughs> will watch it, <laughs> hear it <laughs> and read about it. <laughs> so on one side of my brain, I'm like, this movie's a lot of fun, and it is cool and sleek. On the other side, it's like, it's so dumb. <laughs> it's so <laughs> fucking dumb. It's got a nice, shiny Bond facade, but there's yeah. not a whole lot of depth when you, like, peek behind what's on the screen. <laughs> yeah. I, can, yeah. I, I have to point back at my analogy of just white bread. It tastes good, <laughs> but you're not getting any nourishment from it. There's nothing there to sustain you. No. Nan's gut reaction number for this gut reaction number I was thinking below Thunderball at number 12 above Octopussy but that was my immediate this is a fun action movie you know I had some coffee I had some coffee cake I watched this movie and I was just like <laughs> eyes glazed over kind of enjoyed the action yeah you turned your brain but, off that's what this movie yeah. does so I don't know if I was fully incorporating the like okay there's some weaknesses here or not but when you actually look and dig that gets a little bit more difficult and that's funny because my where i have it is either above or below octopussy it doesn't break the thunderball threshold thunderball's pretty much always been a threshold yeah as is ohmss terrible bad guy but really cool, nails the underwater action and all that. It's got your Connery top-notch coolness. It's got some yep. stupid plot stuff. Of the Connery movies, 
it's the big dumb action movie. Maybe you only live twice as well, but Thunderball is the big dumb action movie equivalent, but it doesn't break that threshold at all, I would say, even though I f***ing hate Largo and I always will. I, I, I probably prefer Elliot Carver to stupid ass Largo. Yeah, media mogul idea is cool. Yeah, this movie is the equivalent of a feel good movie within this franchise, a guilty pleasure, if you will. Sleek, it's cool, it's big, it's loud. It has a plot that's simple and easy to follow without any effort. Babes, chases, all the bells and whistles of Bond, but none of the guts, none of the substance, especially coming after Goldeneye. The only moment that really tries to be of any substance is Bond's relationship with Paris, but her portrayal is short-lived and soap operatic. Yeah. It's cold Bond, which is good, but somewhat forced. There's just nothing there. I like this bad guy in a cartoonish way, but without any kind of deeper motivation than just wanting to have a news network that broadcasts to everyone on the planet simultaneously. It's nice to talk to the world. So overall, he's just a comic book bad guy, which is, again, big dumb action movie. It's fun, but not smart. The news mogul creating the news he sells is honestly interesting, but could have been much darker and more interesting if it went deeper. That is a great idea. It really is. Going after a guy who literally controls everything that goes into people's brains. I started running mad cow disease stories simply because Angus Black, the great British beef baron, lost 10,000 pounds to me in a game of poker and refused to pay up. <laughs> Moreover, there's even less truth in the rumor that I took 100 million francs from the French to keep the stories running for another year. <laughs> that is an interesting idea. And then taking it a step further, he actually creates the news. I'm having fun with my headlines. I need to know the exact number of survivors. It's interesting, but in the end, it's just a big cartoon. Unfortunately, it could have been given that darker, smarter treatment, but they, it's yeah. like they didn't have time for that between 95 and 97. So Octopussy, though, like at first I was like probably below Octopussy. Then the more I think about it, I'm like, maybe above. I think it's better than Octopussy only because I think if we remember we talked about Octopussy is so convoluted and so like the thing that I didn't like about it, or we all didn't like about it was just how overly convoluted it was, how it felt like they were trying to mash two scripts together. And even yeah. though we really did like the end of it, the third act of the movie or the semi third act of the movie where Bond's trying to stop the bomb and that part's actually really exciting and really cool. The rest of the movie is just so like, wait, how do the jewels and how does Berlin and how does the Russian, like how do these plots yeah. mix together and it's very confusing where this movie is very straightforward. Like I, I, I completely understand where it's going. I understand who the villains are. I understand what what's at stake, even though it might be cartoonish. And that's what kind of brings the movie down for me, really, is the personal stakes really aren't there. It's very cartoonish. It's really run of the mill. I think it's definitely better than Octopussy. My question is, is it better than Thunderball? Because there's a part of me that says, maybe it is better than Thunderball. But there's another part of me that's like, I don't know if it's better than Thunderball. And I don't yeah. think it's better than Honor Magic Secret Services, even though, you know, you guys pointed out how ham-fisted Honor Magic Secret Service can be. I do think that movie does plant a very good uh personal stakes for the bond franchise as a whole as well as that particular movie and i do think there's a lot more class in that film and there's a lot more trying to say Agreed. about bond as a character yeah it cannot break secret service you know i have trouble with secret service but secret service just attempting to have some kind of meaning automatically makes it better than the big dumb action movie that you have to yeah. turn your brain off to enjoy. But Secret Service is also a big dumb in some ways is also a big dumb action movie. It's I one of the more never, action. I would how dare it, you? I would never refer to it as a big dumb action movie. But but it does have a lot of action in the film. Like it is a much more action-packed movie than I think people give it credit for. Solid action. It's got motivated action. Motivated action. There's too much action in this movie where it's just what do we do we only have run chase, two fight. years to come out with uh, yeah it's like live and let die when in doubt just throw a punch and start shooting guns and blow shit up it, it, it just it's so dumb this movie's so fucking dumb <laughs> i love it i love this movie it, i it's such a guilty pleasure it's, for I, me. I changed my mind it's number one <laughs> yeah i don't think it's better than secret service yeah but no i way. do think maybe it could be better than thunderball but i'm also i, I could also be swayed in saying it's it's not as good as thunderball okay so this is interesting I'm, that's pretty much where this I is interesting it. hey buttheads comment send us a comment with your stupid opinions about how much you hate this movie you're probably right you should hate on this movie a lot but also watch it and have fun yeah, and then exactly. tell your friends Maybe about chill it. Chill out. Just, Just chill remember out, what you're watching. You're watching 
the Bond movie, which sometimes is smart and then other times is stupid. It's really stupid. <laughs> these, like I always say, these movies are fantastical and dumb. And it's like at a certain point, he's an action hero who just goes, da, 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 and a bunch of people die. It's stupid and it's it's male fantasy and it's awesome. And it's this movie's not going to be at the fucking top ever, but you know. It, it's still a good time. Early on, I felt like there was so much innuendo going on. Yes. And lots of jokes. Like, they yes. really threw a lot of jokes in. The late Commander Bond, who is, I believe, at this moment, on his way to the bottom of the South China Sea. I always wondered how I'd feel if I ever saw you again. He's my new anchor man. <laughs> Now I know. I'm just up here at Oxford, brushing up on a little Danish. I right, say so developed an Oedipus complex. I'm afraid you're going to have to kiss off your lesson, James. We seem to have developed a certain attachment to each other. Just off the cuff, I thought we might link up. Let's stay undercover. You always were a cunning linguist, James. When she calls him a cunning linguist, I... She's a cun... He's you know. a cunning linguist. My wife had asked me what that meant. <laughs> she has a girlfriend moment with M where she's like, don't ask. <laughs> <laughs> don't ask. Into. There's that moment with Stamper at the end where Stamper's like, hey, I have your babe. And he's like, it's over, Stamper. Let her go. Let her go. And I always think, like, the Joker always jumps in my mind where the Joker's like, poor choice of words. I, and, and I'm like, <laughs> why didn't they, this is Bond. And they always make jokes. As soon as he said, let her go, that was the cue for Stamper to be like, okay, and then let her go. <laughs> They didn't finish the script. She needed that moment to be able to take the detonators and throw them to Bond. That's also why when he tied her up, he left just enough mobility <laughs> so that she could reach down and grab the detonators and throw them at Bond. Stop doing but that. she but she couldn't climb up the chain. She had dinosaur hands. Yeah, yeah she, she had dinosaur hands. She got dinosaur you hands. You know, the writers just went nuts with the quips like they yeah. were just like every character gets a quip every character is gonna get a joke that relates to the news or newspapers or some bullshit oh, it's old news elliot station break. that is the goal i may have some breaking news for you elliot we even get several bond uh jokes right like Charlie's definition. Since we haven't defined it in a while, the way I define a Bond joke, it's not just a joke. You're totally correct. This movie has a lot of jokes coming from a lot of different people. But the way this show has defined a Bond joke is that a murder has just occurred, typically by Bond. <laughs> and it's followed up by a joke that is punny. Got a little double meaning to it. I think he got the point. In this movie, there are several. He ejects Guy trying to garret him in the jet. Backseat driver. The second one is when he throws that guy in the red jacket into the printing press, and there's blood everywhere, and he says, We don't print anything these days. And then the last one is when the guy is trying to ambush Bond during Carver's bad guy speech. Sorry about that. I, uh... Tuned out there for a moment, Elliot. <laughs> the second one that you mentioned, Charlie, is the image of this movie that I think about to this day. The fact that you had the blood running on the newspaper and how it ties in with the news. That was like the perfect image for this movie and like it always stuck with me. You forgot the first rule of mass media, Elliot. <laughs> Give the people what they want. <laughs> Carver's death is like, I guess it's okay, but a fitting death, you know me with my fitting death, a fitting death would have, he would have been the guy that falls into the printing press and yeah. then there's blood everywhere. Maybe a massive TV crushing him. Yeah, there you go. Uh, yeah, a, a satellite falls on his head. Ah! Or even yeah. the weird thing with Stamper, when Stamper is like, you and I are going to die together. All he had to do was hold Bond for a minute. And instead, he puts he puts Bond on the ramp so that Bond can then slide down and then he's primed and ready to cut off his jacket. Goldeneye, they're all fitting. It's great. With this, they're just action movie deaths. They're not really thought out. They just perform their function. Yeah, and again, that's probably the purpose of just like, they didn't have the script finished, so they just were like, we gotta, gotta have something crazy happen here. 
these are like nitpicky things, but it's all yeah. just kind of part and parcel of. Yeah, screw it. <laughs> yeah, pump out an action movie within two years with a light story that everybody can follow, and let's just try to make as much money as possible again. And they did it. They pulled it off, but in our list, it's not going to be anywhere near Goldeneye, where no. all of the comments that we got for Goldeneye, I'm looking at them going, did you guys watch the same movie? And in my headcanon for that night, it's almost as if all these dudes were accidentally commenting on the Tomorrow Never Dies thread. Everything they wrote about, I'm like, are you talking about Goldeneye or Tomorrow Never Dies? <laughs> it sounds like you're talking about Tomorrow Never Dies. Nikolai said that uh, Pierce... Brosnan's performance isn't very good. And with this, it's like, it's the same, but there's no substance there. So it is a little more, eh. He's definitely um, better in GoldenEye than this one. Yeah, yeah, you don't get that. You don't get subtle moments like when, you know, he looks down and he says, not our best hour, or when, like, anything between him and Trevelyan. Like, you don't but get when any When he kills the assassin guy, like, that's a good moment for Pierce. Oh, yeah, it's badass, it's but it doesn't, lot else it's kind of like, eh. Yeah. Okay. So like Nikolai was saying, he's very monotone for a lot of it, doesn't show a lot of range. Blastoise had said, when the action does arrive, it's nonstop with no time to breathe. There's just no intrigue. It's very much point A to B, trying to tie all the set pieces together as fast as possible so the ADD generation doesn't get bored. That's not Goldeneye, that's this movie. That, def that is yeah. this movie. Yeah. He says, Judy Dench's M never got the right chemistry with Bond until Craig came along, in my opinion. Yeah, that's not true. There was a purpose to his dialogue with M in the last movie. I think you're a sexist, misogynist dinosaur. With this, M's fine, but M is just Basil Exposition in this. Hello, Austin. I'm Basil Exposition with British Intelligence. I'm sending you to Hamburg, 007. We've arranged for you to be invited tonight to a party at Carver's Media Center. We have just received word that Dr. Evil is planning a trap for you tonight at the Electric Psychedelic Pussycat Swingers Club here in Swinging London. We'll be there. Austin, it's a swinging ship. It's my happening, baby, and it freaks me out. Yeah, man. There's nothing deep about it. She's just performing her. She function. stands up for him and like the let's not just go Admiral blowing Robert, stuff up. She gets but, the one yeah. quip with balls. With all due respect, Tim, sometimes I don't think you have the balls for this job. Perhaps, but the advantage is I don't have to think with them all the time. Oh, 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 oh. What's he doing? What the hell is he doing? His job. I like that. You know, that's yeah, that's some yeah. classic Bernard Lee M yeah, action yeah, there. Yeah. You know, I think it was Blastoise that was saying this uh, that Goldeneye was the movie that introduced one man army Bond, and I'm like, nah, dude, it's this movie, <laughs> this movie, because Goldeneye scenes where it looks like one man army Bond, there are certain elements at play that justify it. Whereas with this, Bond has his own little commando scene in the opening. Where Bond isn't running away from the bazaar. He's he he eventually is escaping, but first he has to go into the bazaar and just start blowing everything up and nobody can stop him. That's one man army bond, right? It's yeah. cool. I, I think the prologue is cool. It cool. It's cool. Yeah. But that is one man army bond. And then in the ending, that's one man army bond as well, because it's it, like again, in Goldeneye, Bond goes in. To sabotage Alex's operation, immediately gets captured, and then with the exploding pen manages to still pull it off and run away. This is one man going in and having his own commando scene where he kills a hundred guys just like shooting and blowing shit up. And Bond uses the exact same strategy, which is go in, plant a bomb, and then at the opportune moment, blow the bomb as a distraction to then kill everybody. But in Goldeneye, Alec Trevelyan knew better and shut that down. But then in this, Bond actually makes good on it. Just breach the hull. They're going to see us on radar. And fine, whatever, fair. But then it's just followed by double-wielding, shooting, chaos, craziness, big dumb action movie. Kill those bastards! I think the prologue immediately sets the tone of big dumb action movie again it's one man army bond who like i love the idea of putting bond in a position where he has no choice but to go for the bombs he can't just get out of there he has to go in there those are soviet sp5 nuclear torpedoes there's enough plutonium to make chernobyl look like picnic but he doesn't yeah. do it in like a smart way 
he does it in a big dumb action movie way. He just starts blowing everything up. Just immediately punches that guy in the face yeah. after lighting his cigarette. <laughs> Instead of just like trying to sneak well, that by. Too. I love there are two times in the movie where he <laughs> goes to light a cigarette for a guy, and the second one's my favorite. I've I adore the moment where he just <laughs> And the guy's like, oh, <laughs> it's great. But um, but the first one, I wish he would have done the same thing in the first one where he just like does the hands thing. Like I would have loved if he would have done the same thing. The guy looks at him weird because that introduction to Bond, it doesn't have the same care and craft that Martin Campbell put into the introduction of Bond and Goldeneye. Again, in the smarter version of the script, the two cigarette instances would have been the same thing. And Bond would have just punched the guy in the face without a lighter and then snuck his way onto the jet and then started shooting everybody. So it really communicates something specific, which is that in the second instance, Bond does something smart. He doesn't have a lighter on him, so he tricks the guy to take him out. He could have done that in the opening, but then we wouldn't have the goofy gadget that immediately telegraphs that this is going to be a goofy Bond movie with a bunch of gadgets. It's very gadget heavy. It is very gadget heavy. I think they His saw Goldeneye cool. and they, they, they really doubled down on the gadgetry in this yeah. film. And Whereas they're just like the they're last, cool gadgets, like Nancy they said. They were they're cool. Yeah, they're nothing, nothing lame. Like what was it in For Your Eyes Only, where you had like the the bullshit glasses and like, or was it a view to kill? A view I can't to remember. Kill the view to kill. He had some bullshit glasses. The worst like, gadget of all time is polarized glasses. But I will say, the dumbest thing I thought was in this movie was the walking down the walls thing. I thought that was kind of yeah, dumb. She's like, <laughs> like I feel like that was like I feel like that was the filmmakers being like, well, we have to recognize Mission Impossible because it also did really well in 1995 yeah. and you know and like that was their attempt to do it but it's kind of lame and she's just like hi and i'm like if yeah. you're in that situation the first thing any of the bad guys is going to do is just start hey shooting that was you. when james bond fell in love with her <laughs> <laughs> okay so we've got the lighter grenade and the sticky grenade from the opening okay we have the cell phone that's got the stun gun and the fingerprint thing and it drives his car that's cool we have got the watch detonator <laughs> that's got like the little sonic thing that breaks the jar at the end. Okay. And then Chinese stuff. We have like a Chinese cue scene almost where Bond's going through all their shit. Always been a fan of Chinese technology. He's like, oh, it's the same. He's like that same watch. This looks familiar. We've made some improvements. Because it's China and they basically take any American product and they make a cheaper version okay, of it that I you can go and buy. I was trying to figure out what that was. I thought it was like a gadget he had in a previous movie that did the same thing or something like yeah he's he's like he's basically telling her he's like oh wait i've seen this before this is omega watch that cheap that knockoffs. you made but you guys took me to rip off of it yeah i love pierce's reaction to the flame throwing dragon thing though yeah it's like seems really like he was actually surprised on set or something that's like how remington steel would have reacted to that <laughs> visible to radar but not the human eye <laughs> very novel so to get to my ultimate point, it's that the smarter version of this movie is Goldeneye. Goldeneye was such a hit that they said, just make the same movie again, but they made it in appearance, only in appearance, with zero understanding for the story elements that were underlying that movie. And they put a dumbass in charge of this one instead of a smart dude who cares, like Martin Campbell. They just put a rented director in there who didn't understand Goldeneye and remade it, but only in appearance, and then rushed it out the door. It's like shameless in that regard. And, and that's where it's not the worst Bond movie ever made. Uh, it's, it's like borderline diamonds are forever where it's it's just like we don't give a f and we're just shameless yeah. like we're here to eat popcorn and titties and explosions yeah, as as big dumb action as the pre-title sequence is i really like it it's yeah. hard to hate it you can't hate this movie you <laughs> try I, to I hate say, this movie but you can't i will say the 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 difference though between those two movies though it's like golden eye they're introducing a new bond we're getting our first appearance of pierce brosnan so we're we're slowly showing Pierce Brosnan in the film. And we kind of do that in this movie. But the introduction is more like you like you said, it's it's a lot louder. And the other thing is it has nothing. It has, doesn't really weigh. It 
barely weighs on the plot. Yes, we see one of Carver's minions and he's got the device, but that's it. Exactly. We always talk about a, a pre-title sequence, a prologue that is like uh, uh, relevant. And this one is, but only just in, in like... One minor detail. Just introduces yeah. another character and you're like, yeah. okay. And it doesn't play on the rest of the plot. I do appreciate, though, that continuing the post-Soviet Union thing, there was a problem with like, okay, this entire country is falling apart. And they have all these weapons. It's like a terrorist supermarket. Can't you people keep anything locked up? Yeah. Well, that was a real thing. It was a hard to, it, it was hard to keep a lid on all these things. But all in all, okay, here's the encoder. Who cares? We introduced that briefly. But let's get back to... Where would he like the bombs delivered? Ba-da, ba-da. Like, it's just, <laughs> it's cool and sleek, but it's big, dumb shit. and then and then naked women naked digital women and all that and and x-rays for some reason we have (laughs) x-rays and then cool and then where does the movie open up bond's just in bed with a supermodel we don't know why he just is That's the hottest you. part. And you, know what that's, you know what I find strange is that is also the hottest part of this movie is when yeah. he's sleeping with the supermodel. Yeah, he has this sexy moment with Terry Hatcher, but it's like a brief just unzips her dress and then you see yeah. her from their backside. And you're like, so Great. you don't see her pregnant belly. You don't see her pregnant belly. And then she, you know, she obviously sleeps with Bond, but we don't really see much else than that except for her walk of shame. <laughs> yeah. And then that scene ends. And then the next time we see anything remotely sexy is maybe that shower scene which is kind of like eh. and then and then the very end of the movie is them making out and you're like okay but like compared to the last movie we had goldeneye and you know natasha and him are like natalia simeonova natasha and him are like they sleep together before even the third act and like it's pretty hot steamy scene and he has a hot scene with on a top there's a scene before that with on a top killing that guy it's kind of hot (laughs) <laughs> don't remind charlie <laughs> you know it's so much better he does a lot of biting in this movie yeah i know i specifically noticed that like my theory okay. is i think he misses Zenya zargevna on a top who just all the bite like they and he's like trying to find himself another s&m babe but he's just like he's just, He's so bitey. Nans, speaking of all this Pierce Brosnan sex appeal, how have you been sleeping lately? Fine. (laughs) Because, back to the Pierce Brosnan ASMR segment. Maybe that's why I needed my coffee in the middle of this movie. (laughs) I do remember this was the first Bond movie that was heavily like marketed and like, you know, I remember seeing the commercials for things for this movie that I remember at least. Like even though Goldeneye had come out. Well, it's like Goldeneye was was something of a sleeper, right? The video game, if you look into the history of the video game, it just kind of happened. It wasn't this, it wasn't a thing where the board convened and everybody's like, we gotta, you know, it wasn't like Elliot Carver's speech where he's like, I want films, I want books. I want books, I want films, I want TV, I want radio. I want the world, I want the whole world. world I want to domination. lock it all up in Complete, my pocket. It's my bar and I want to end 24 hours a day. I want tomorrow. And then, yeah, with this movie, it's like the video games were planned. I, I wouldn't be surprised if there were toys and shit. It was like GoldenEye was such a hit. This yeah. is the follow-up where, what do we do? We already did our Cold War thing. We already milked the end of the Cold War. What the f*** do we do now? Let's just do, like, big action movie 
What's the plot? What's the story? Shit if I know. But we need to cash in immediately, so let's just get a rough outline going on and fill in the gaps with action to distract everybody from the reality that there's really no story going on here, and then just throw a bunch of product placement over it, like Moonraker. Well, you kind of said in the beginning about how this movie is like, some of the stuff that happens in this movie is relevant today, and and I'll get out my, you know, my tinfoil hat and put it on, you know, whether it's uh, social media or, or the actual news outlets. You know, we have 24 hour news and like how it has affected us and, and how we see the world now controlling them in a way that's just more like this is what's going on in the world and people believing it and taking it for face value. Are they merely tools for information, Mr. Bond? No disinformation. But that being said, as I watched this movie this time around, I was like, oh, this is the third remake we've gotten of You Only Live Twice. And I only realized that yeah. after I watched it this third time because I, or this hundredth time now, because I was like, oh, yeah, because because Elliot Carver's playing two sides. This time it's not Russia and the Americans. This time it's British and the Chinese because of Hong yeah. Kong that kind of ties in with it, even though they don't talk about that. Ricardo Cantorel says GoldenEye isn't a poor movie, but it's by far the most overrated film in the franchise. The movie is just a pastiche of old Bond films, and it never has the guts to really examine Bond's character. Just, Bond's character's all over this fucking movie. If you want to watch a pastiche of the Bond films, go back and watch The Spy Who Loved Me, which yes. is a very obvious pastiche of a lot, bunch of Bond films. We like, even they said throw that movie was that. the best of Bond. Second remake being um, uh, The Spy, the spy Who Loved Me. Me. Yeah, You Only Live Twice, Spy Who Loved Me. There's also a little For Your Eyes Only in there. They go inside the sunken ship, and then there's mm -hmm. like chaos, and they got to escape. In my notes, I put such a vast improvement in underwater searching through a ship since <laughs> For Your Eyes Only, which was in yeah. the 80s. And coupled with the Spy Who Loved Me boat layer, you know, like there, there's certainly an influence from previous movies. It's subtle. Like... It yeah, like when I say it's a remake of of You Only Live Twice, and I think more so you, The Spy Who Loved Me because it's two government agents, you know, teaming up to solve this problem. And falling in love. A British agent in love with a Russian agent. Could this possibly be the moment for us to pool our resources? Get down! We're going to finish this together. How romantic. It's not as over the top. Whereas like The Spy Who Loved Me is very over, it's very obvious when you have Oh, they're taking these ships, much like they took the spaceships and You Only Live Twice. Yeah, it's the World War Three stakes of You Only Live Twice, coupled with the underwater stolen missile of Thunderball, coupled with the spy romance. But at the same time, it does come across as wholly new. It has the distinct news thing, which is interesting yeah. enough that that's very, like... No other movie has that. I'd say this is their return to the days of Moonraker and The Spy Who Loved Me, where you have like your big megalomaniacal, yeah. uh, robber baron type of guy. Megalomaniacal characters. Megalomaniacal. 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 He's like Stromberg. He's very much like a Stromberg type Stromberg character. Stromberg was just crazy. He was yeah. just crazy. Yeah. Hugo Drax thought he was saving humanity. Not crazy. With this, I wanted one or the other. You really are quite insane. The distance between insanity and genius is measured only by success. I wish we, we got hints of it, but we didn't really get a fully fleshed out um, picture of an Elliot Carver who thinks he's saving the world. Because today I would argue, um, again, it, it, where you and I kind of sparred with the man with the golden gun, where you were saying, the movie's outdated because of, you know, we're not in, in an energy crisis. And I was like, dude, we are always in an energy crisis every day. That's where that movie is timeless. But this story where it's like human beings head up the news and they're not always objective, that's also eternal. Like believing that these corruptible, fallible human beings are always objective about the news where that's like, especially today, demonstrably false, especially when they turn all of their news people into celebrities and they put them in movies and sh There are no more journalists. There's just actors spouting off pre-written lines. That should freak people out. Every single news anchor is an actor now and we just believe that everything they say is objective. Doesn't matter what your politics are. Like if you believe the news, you're, you're just a idiot. Oh, we're off the what? air. 
we're off the air. What I'm getting at is that the people doing that, though, are either opportunists or they think they're saving the world, right? We may be twisting the truth a little bit, just a little bit, but we're saving the world. He says, though, at one point, Great men have always manipulated the media to save the world. Okay, now you're saving the world? Like, since when are you saving the world? What do you get? Just exclusive broadcasting rights in China for the next hundred years. But please, Elliot, pick a lane. Are you trying to just secure lucrative broadcasting rights in China, or are you trying to save the world? Which one is it? And I could go along with it being both, but there really isn't ever a time that they tie both of them together, except for his speech in the opening. I promise to report the news without fear or favor. I promise to be a force for good in this world. But you can't really trust his speech in the opening because it's not like it's something that he delivers to Bond in a personal manner. It's something that he's delivering to the entire world. So obviously it's going to be a bunch of BS when his whole entire shtick is manipulating all the people watching to achieve his goals. So it couldn't pick a lane. Starting a war for ratings. Save the world. I have to save the world. What? This guy's just a cartoon. It would have worked if maybe it was something like the Brits and the English were already at each other's throats because of, I don't know, Hong Kong. And his plan was to ignite the fire between them and then immediately use General Chang to come to peace. But he will be just in time to take over the government, negotiate a truce, and emerge as a world leader. And then at the same time also make some money by getting the broadcasting rights. Instead, he causes the tensions in the first place, which is the key ingredient in making him a cartoony character because his motivation is more on the side of just pure evil. <laughs> And my only problem with that is that it just seems so arbitrary. Why have the Chinese blocked him out? Can he just pay them off? He just wants China. They're celebrating the launch of a new satellite because now he has the ability to reach every human being on the earth. Except the Chinese who've refused broadcast rights. But why? I think it's a very important why the Chinese have not given him broadcasting rights because he's shown that he's a corrupt mother and that he would be willing to say whatever they want him to say. So why? Why is China blocking him? It seems like they're a match made in heaven. Use it to make it a fake news! Outstanding. He already has money. He's got a ton of money. But it's like, I just want to be able to go on and, and, and just like, I turn on a camera and I'm worldwide. It's, it's, like, it's like not enough of a motivation. It needed that element of... I'm doing this not for me. You don't understand, Mr. Bond. The people of the earth are sheep, and I am their shepherd. I must save humanity from itself. You really are quite insane. I'm saving the world. Because at one point, he equates himself to God. And by midnight tonight, I'll have reached and influenced more people than anyone in the history of this planet, save God himself. So it's like, okay, we've got our little, like, megalomaniacal god complex here or as bond puts it he has an edifice complex but it seems like it really is just an ego thing which is less interesting than characterizing him in a way where he, you might actually be on his side again like like i said about H hugo drax well that's why like for me his motivation was weak because i thought that was his only motivation was he, i want a hundred year exclusive rights he says that right which by the way if you read his lips he says 50 and they overdubbed oh, it really? with 100, yeah, and <laughs> oh. which 100 is better. But anyway, yeah. what I'm saying is that I would have preferred, it, it, his character would have been more like Hugo Drax. Again, I love Hugo Drax, because his whole thing is, you can actually understand why he's doing what he's doing. He's not doing it just to be evil. I just, I want to kill everybody. He's like, no, we're saving humanity. He thinks he's the good guy, and that's why he's interesting. Stromberg, just crazy. He just wants to f fish. That's it. Elliot Carver could have been crazy, but he wasn't. Instead, he hints at the fact that he's making the world better in his initial speech. The power to illuminate the far corners of the globe, not for higher profits, but for higher understanding between the people of this great planet. He gives his Declaration of Principles, which is straight up a William Randolph Hearst thing. Declaration of Principles. My Declaration of Principles. Which then he later references William Randolph Hearst. Look at William Randolph Hearst, who told his photographers, you provide the pictures, I'll provide the war. 
I've just taken it one step further. Some people have speculated or is outright saying that he started the Spanish-American War. Exactly. Put on your tinfoil hat. That's why I keep saying this is nothing new. 17 British sailors murdered. Well, this settles it. We sent in the fleet. That's why it's frustrating that this movie could have been smart, but is just not. Recently, we pulled out of a country, right? And everything went to sh and the media freaked out. Well, because the media makes more money when we're in a state of war. Words are the new weapons. Satellites, the new artillery. Caesar had his legions. Napoleon had his armies. I have my divisions. TV, news, magazines. They make yeah. money when we're in a state of war. So that's why we pull out of a certain country. We pulled out of Station A, I'll say, and the media freaks out. Ah! Ah, no, we need to go back in. We need to blow everybody up because it's in the media's best interest for us to be at war. That's why this movie will always be relevant. But what I'm saying is that the character of Elliot Carver is kind of made to be a cartoon because he doesn't really have any depth other than like, I just have a big ego. But, 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 but at the same time, he is this big cartoonish Charles Gray style yeah. bad guy who is fun. And that's where yeah. it all goes back to big, dumb action movie. Yeah. So I'm like torn. It seems like we, they were trying to make a modern version of like a Blofeld or a Stromberg that doesn't 100% fit that profile, be, but it doesn't really matter because the movie's entertaining and the character's entertaining. So you just kind of forget about it. But that was that's kind of where the cartoony aspect comes in is while, while people want to put a face to an, an issue that people have problems with, the same time, it just comes off as cartoony because it, it reminds me of Captain Planet. Most environmentalists or scientists or whatever, they don't like Captain Planet because they basically took a lot of these big problems with big industrialists and made them into bad guys. In reality, a lot of these people are trying to work with industrialists to find and figure out ways to, to curb any kind of pollution or problems that we have in the world. And this movie kind of does the same thing where you're basically just saying, News Corp bad guy, and that's may or may not always be the case, and so they just make him a cart, and he's in a cartoon in that sense where it's just like, yeah, he's the bad guy, and he does all the bad things, and he has hired all these bad people. On top of that, he's like his performance is he even says at one point that he likes like an audience, an audience. and so yeah. he mm -hmm. comes across as as like just big performance just like, guy, yeah. like I want to be Comic on TV, book, bad and, guy. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And so that's the thing. On one hand, it's fun. On one hand, it fits big, dumb action movie. I want movies. I want books. But on the other hand, it's a wasted opportunity, especially following in the footsteps of Alec Trevelyan, who was fully fleshed out. Why? <laughs> Hilarious question. I want to know why. I want TV shows. You know, like, it's, it's crazy. He needs an audience, you know? He needs his audience. And Nance is that audience, right, Nance? <laughs> That's me. <laughs> But this is why I say it goes back to Moonraker and The Spy Who Loved Me, where there's no commonality between Bond and the bad guy. This goes back to, hmm. like, again, Goldeneye, as far as Pierce goes, Goldeneye was, like, equal but opposite in Alec Trevelyan. Now we're back to the days of big, megalomaniacal, rich bad guy who has some kind of like world domination scheme, him and Bond, they have no similarities at all. And when Bond is in his presence, he's constantly just undermining his ego. I would have thought watching your TV shows was torture enough. I mean, when it comes to undermining somebody's ego, there's no better method than ripping a massive 20 story photograph of them in half. Like I've said before, I love when Bond is the provocateur, when he goes into a situation and he just starts talking shit because he wants to get a reaction from the bad guy. With this, it's almost too much. Like, he straight up is like, you been on a boat lately? Say if you wanted to manipulate the course of governments, or people, or even a ship. Perhaps I should commission you to write a novel. Oh, heavens no, I'd be lost at sea. Adrift. He's more Hugo Drax than anybody, because even at the beginning, M says, I didn't want to discuss it in front of the minister, but that mysterious signal came from one of Carver's satellites. PM would have my head if he knew you're investigating him. He could never be a bad guy. He's he's Hugo Drax. On behalf of the British government, I apologize. There is a hilarious, giant, gaping plot hole in this movie when no. it comes to that banner escape. Before I say it, can you guys pinpoint it? 
No. So they jump off the building and it rips, and then they break through the window. Yeah, and then they probably took an elevator or something, right? Had the banner taken them all the way down to the ground level, and then they had to immediately get the hell away, and they grab the bike and all that? I mean, I love the idea. It's a great concept for a chase, that they are handcuffed together, and that they have to work together to get away. What are you? Give me that! It's fun. It's a really fun chase. No right. No left. Who's driving? We'll get to the helicopter part. It's the helicopter is dumb, but um, <laughs> it's cool. It's it. It's cool. It's sleek. The whole fucking movie is cool and sleek, but it's dumb. <laughs> but what does she do the moment that things cool down? And they're in the shower. She uses her earring to take the handcuff off. Yeah. Why the. F- didn't she do that the mm. moment they f- landed through that window and they stood up and, every- and they're looking around at all the business people? She should have immediately taken the handcuffs off. And that's what I'm saying. Had they been, she liked a- being a- cuffed to bond. But Charlie, you're not that character. She was not in the mindset, much like, you know, Maud Adams pointing a gun at Bond, even though she knows that Bond's here to save her. No, she's a yeah. secret agent who would have wanted to immediately Doesn't matter. take that handcuff Gift. off. It's not the same at all. Charlie, you know I'm being facetious. Yes, but the character <laughs> of Wei Lin is smart enough to go, what do I need to do right now? I mean, even in the helicopter, as they're flying there, she could have taken it and undid it. Like, at any moment, she could have undone the handcuffs, and she just didn't so that they could have a fun, cool, sleek chase scene. Why did she wait that long? Did she, did she want to be handcuffed to Mr. Handsome? <laughs> No, yes. she didn't. Stupid. She didn't. Stupid. Uh, she okay, didn't. so helicopter chase. Uh, that yeah, the helicopter chase is just is just dumb. Like okay, it's like awesome. okay, why why do they jump the helicopter? <laughs> why do cool. they do that? Because it's awesome, Charlie. That's a cool stunt. Well, they like back up to get speed, right? And I was like, oh, I guess that direction is blocked off, but we don't see that. But. They're like, we got to jump the chopper, I guess. Yeah. How much more exciting would it have been if it happened in the moment? You know, like they're driving along and if they slow down, they'll go off the edge of this building and they'll get chopped up by the blades. So they have no choice but in the moment to gun it and jump it. They have no choice but to jump it. But instead it's, hey, let's turn around so we can gain speed to jump this thing, even though we could just go in the other direction. I think what happened was... And I think I did read this was when they were doing this movie, they weren't sure how to top the tank chase sequence from the last movie. So they were like, helicopter. They're like, yes, helicopter. Well, again, this this goes back to what we've said before. Goldeneye, uh, the action felt like it had a purpose. Every action scene had a purpose. It had some kind of motivation to it. With this, it's just filler. Because we don't have a script, so we just need to fill all of this time with these drawn-out action sequences that may be fun, but they're just, again, they're white bread. It's like, how do they get away? Sure, they could have done a car chase sequence, uh, but I think, again, like I think they were just like entertainment value, helicopter, motorcycle chase, probably more entertaining than just another car chase, which we've seen a hundred times. And and so it's difficult, right? Because they're trapped and it's like, okay, grab this hook and then go straight at the helicopter. And the helicopter is just like, like that. (laughs) It's just a blade. It's awesome. (laughs) It's just magically floating in place. Like, it's not like this. It's like that. And the guy like cocks his gun, like he's getting ready to shoot them. And they, they just keep coming Three straight at him blades. and they're just, but he would have to shoot through the blades, but it's like turn and shoot. Everything having to do with the helicopter is dumb. All in all, it's just that both of these helicopter stunts feel like some kind of Universal Studios stunt show where the helicopter just positions itself wherever it needs to be for some stunt to happen. That's why it's the turn off your brain, just enjoy it for what it is movie. But like it, it compared to Gold Knight, it's dumb. It's just big, dumb f***ing action movie. It's just dumb. You know Stupid. what part of the movie? There's two parts <laughs> of that sequence that always... Well, there's just really one part, but the second the second part is I love that they drive through people having sex, and she's just like, <laughs> okay, she's whatever. not too worried about the roof. They just collapse through. The first thing that always bothers me about that sequence is just how blatant they are with BMW, because I always kind of remember yeah. it in my mind that he comes out, they come down to the motorcycles there, 
she's about to pick like uh, some other motorcycle. They were gonna pick a car, and then he was like, oh, my, 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 this quick. And then he goes, no, 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 BMW, because you know this movie had a contract with BMW, and they needed yeah. to promote BMW, so they get a BMW motorcycle. I thoroughly appreciate, as usual, that James Bond, sexist, misogynist dinosaur, relic of the Cold War, insists on driving the bike. Give me a good old-fashioned misogynist Bond who bangs chicks and doesn't give a fuck. He's like, get the fuck out of your way, Lynn. We're taking a bike because it's quick, and I'm going to drive it. <laughs> Bitch, what sit on my call? dick. <laughs> sit on my dick. Don't get any ideas. I'd never dream of it. I would have just preferred a a torture scene that also involved them maybe overhearing the plot kind of like in Goldfinger or something. Instead, we get we get a lot of just big dumb action scenes along with um uh Elliot Carver info dumps, which is like on one hand that's kind of what his character is is I like an audience. I want to tell you how smart I am. I only gratify your curiosity because you're the one man I've met capable of appreciating what I've done. But on the other hand, uh, it just lends to s less intrigue, I guess. He's going to tell you everything that's going on as opposed to Bond kind of snooping around and figuring it out. And then when they find out what's going to happen, they immediately inform their separate governments. Hours later, M busts through the door and she's like, I just got this message from China. Clearly in the editing, they kind of shifted that scene around so that we could have some urgency going into act three. Carver's been playing both sides for fools. It is such a turn off your brain movie. Yeah. You know, it does have a very simple, straightforward plot, but but in in the details of that simple, straightforward plot, it asks you to just like, just look at the titties and the explosions. <laughs> just, you know, and even down to something like the opening, right? The title sequence, it starts with a bunch of news images and pixels. And it's like, oh, maybe that's like the core theme of this. And then it shoots through all of that. And then what do you have? You just have a sea of naked women. And it's like, that's everything <laughs> you need to know about this movie. <laughs> oh, it might be smart. It might be smart. It's just titties and explosions. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Uh -uh. So speaking of titties. <laughs> and I like titties and I like explosions, but like. Speaking of titties. Uh, Nan, I'm going to ask Nans this and I'll ask you to this, Charlie, I guess. What is your guys' uh, opinion on Waylon as a character? Michelle, uh, Michelle yeah. I like her. Bond makes out with her and yeah. it, he wasn't trying to give her oxygen, but it just worked out. Yeah. They don't have the <laughs> moment, right? No. They don't have the moment where yeah. they fall for each other. Yeah, there's no romance between those two characters. Not a bit. Even throughout the entire movie, even though they have all these little fun play against each other moments because they're both kind of competing for the same information and then they kind of yeah. team up which eventually. Is good. That's which good. Which is great. We did yeah. that in That's uh, the Spy, spy Who Love Me. Love, that's yeah. the Spy Love Me. But yeah. I feel like there's no romance between these two characters. No. Like some might say there's no chemistry. And I wouldn't say there's no chemistry necessarily, as there is just nothing romantic between the two of them. I feel like Wei Lin is a great character. I feel like she she's badass, of course. Yeah. She kicks, you know, she beats up all these dudes, and I totally believe it. Yeah, that's cool. But at the same time, she just feels like another secret agent to James Bond. There are a couple times where they share a look, but mm -hmm. they come out of nowhere. When he's in her like secret Q room, he looks at her and it gets that little like, oh. but that's about it, right? <laughs> There's never that moment where you yeah. feel like, okay, it's on. And then even when he, he finger quotes, kisses her at the end, technically he's just giving her air and they, and they big yeah. romantic swell, right? Big yeah. romantic music swell. But it's like, he's not kissing her so much as he's giving her the breath of life. There's never a moment where they're like, oh yeah, they're totally gonna bang. Like, I never yeah. feel that about these two characters They just have at looks. All. Trapped. Never. He says never, and then they, 
and then they have like their cute moment in the shower. Yeah, that shower scene doesn't even really work for me. Like if they had a romantic yeah. moment before. Yeah. Maybe Wei Lin just slept with Elliot Carver. He just slept with Paris Carver and they meet up in the hallway and he's like, would you find out? Here's what I found out. That, that's that's honestly that's honestly interesting. No, that's honestly interesting because the oh, whole time, great. you know, like th- th- when wow. when he's telling when he's telling uh, Paris, like I think I might give her a job, and she's like, "Oh yeah, I bet she's gonna give you the job." Yeah, I'm thinking of getting Wei Lin behind a news desk. That's wonderful. I'm sure she won't resist too much. It's kind of heavy on the. Maybe Elliot isn't exactly faithful, but then nothing comes yeah, of that. I like women That's that a big take nothing, the initiative right? and all that stuff. Yeah, exactly. Like, he seems like he's intent on banging Wei Lin. Currencies are off. Your stock is soaring. I don't believe we've met. Elliot Cobb. Wei Lin. It's almost like Wei Lin. Like, they tried <laughs> to do on a top or pussy galore. It's like, wait, like, <laughs> bet she makes a lot of noise. But, but <laughs> not, but like, no, no. <laughs> it's not like chew me. Chew me. Really? They already used <laughs> chew me, and they couldn't use chew they me again. They couldn't think of another one. Elliot Cobb. Chew me. Anyway, jumping to that though, jumping to the party scene. That's like our one moment of like where they kind of try to do the classy thing, you know? Like, let's not do baccarat or a casino. Let's have Bond show up to a swanky media mogul party. A Steve Jobs party. Yeah. So it's like okay, yeah. that's cool. I really like the moment when they order drinks for each other and she of course because you know because that's the thing right with the bond stuff you always have to find a unique way to deliver the classic lines just to keep it fresh and they you know they they used to just say it my name is bond james bond or he'd order his drink or whatever and then from here on it's always trying to find a clever way to sneak it in there so it's not stale and so she orders the drink for him mr bond will have a vodka martini shaken not stirred Showing that he's never changed. He's still the same guy ordering vodka martinis, shaken, not stirred. And then he Chicago, orders just a, a straight shot of tequila. Straight and she's shot. like, I'm not a sorority girl anymore. <laughs> I'll take a glass of champagne because I'm... Carver champagne. I, yeah, yeah, I'm like, I'm wealthy. I'm married to this really successful dude. I see you've moved up in the world, Paris. You're still James Bond doing the same f- thing that you've always been doing yeah. so i like that moment the only trouble is that just in general like okay from because where do we go from there how do you really know him i told you he's the banker i met him in zurich you're a terrible liar dear and then later when he's confronting her on it and he kind of knows she's lying then we cut to bond and i love i love me a moment of bond sitting in the dark drinking vodka just waiting for bad guys to show up I love that trope. That's like my favorite Bond trope. So he's doing that, and then she shows up. I was curious who Carver would send. He's on to you. Turn around and go home. You can tell him he didn't get anything out of me. So it's like, did he send her, or did she just come, you know, of her own accord? Yeah. And then later, Elliot says, You're the one who wrote my late wife's obituary. When you asked it to betray me. When did that ever happen? You know what I'm saying? It's kind of muddy there where it's like there was never that definitive moment. It was more like she went to see him. We don't know if Carver sent her or not. So then she bangs him. And yes, that is betraying him. But we never get that moment where Carver comes to find out that his wife just cheated on him. He only thinks that they may have had sex years ago before they were married. Tell me, James. So then she tells him about the secret hatch after letting him inside of her Terry hatch. But Carver doesn't know about either of those. But before that, it's like, okay, wait, wait, wait. Did Carver send her? Because if he did, why? Why? What he should have done was send Dr. Kaufman straight to Bond's hotel room. Instead, he sends his sexy ass wife. And then later he's all pissed off because she says the gun under the pillow thing. So it's like, okay, wait, is he pissed off? Is this, is this just an ego thing that he's pissed off that his wife used to be with this guy? Like, he he immediately kills her. Like, immediately. Yeah. Just by finding out that they used to have a relationship that she she lied about. I mean, who wants to tell their, 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 their significant other that they used to fuck somebody who's like, I mean, like, 
Elliot Carver and James Bond, Pierce Brosnan, are like night and day. And she even says... Casual acquaintances. He dated my roommate in Zurich. And the only evidence he has is that she knows that he sleeps with a gun under his pillow and that Gupta thinks that Bond is a government agent without really having any proof yet. Bond's got a perfect employment record. Ten years, he's crossed every T, he's dotted every I. Which means? Government agent. I think we should set an appointment for my wife with the doctor. Within that false context, she could be telling the truth. Her roommate could easily have told her that her boyfriend sleeps with a gun under his pillow. My whole point being that he never confronts her on it. He just immediately murders her. You know what I mean? It's like, he immediately kills her. Like, yeah. immediately kills her, as opposed to kind of fleshing that out a little more so that maybe we give a shit when she dies. You know, there's like there was something there. It would make more sense to immediately kill her if it was just a woman he was sleeping with, but they're actually married, which is, I thought, kind of weird. Yeah. So he's like, she betrayed me. It's like, well, dude, she banged Bond way before you got married. And then Bond left her devastated and so so yes like it, it would have made more sense if he would have found out that she slept with him and then kill her but it's just the do you still sleep with a gun under your pillow and immediately he's like i gotta kill this bitch <laughs> <laughs> you don't like the idea that there's not another scene in between there and i do feel like a normal guy would just be like well i got her in the end so yeah you, you would think that there was like he had Clearly had they gone with like issues, had yeah. they gone with brosnan you know in the movie bonds like i can get you out of the country in four hours and they had done something like that where you know they left mm -hmm. they leave wherever they're at they go someplace else there's another scene where they're on some island someplace and then she got killed. But I do think the movie's just trying to condense action and just trying to make exactly. it's like quicker. Exactly. It's like all that. We just need another chase scene. Like you it's kind of like it's kind of like you get it. Like there was a prior relationship. We needed this. And I really do feel like that was one of the things that they were just like, "Oh crap, we need some personal thing." We we're comparing it to Goldeneye. And Goldeneye had these really great personal stakes where, you know, he's he's going up against one of his fellow former agents, somebody who was, you know, one of his good colleagues and everything. How do we get that in this movie? Uh, he has a former love interest who's played by Lois Lane. Well, now it's more personal that Bond offs Carver because, you know, he killed Apparently her. Apparently Paris his, is an important love interest of Bond. Paris in is an important like, love oh, interest right. of Bond, but you really don't really get yep. that and it feels kind of flat. Yeah, shoehorn it in. But if that scene wasn't in the movie... He's probably going to kill Carver anyway. That would have been more interesting. Like, a, oh, we've seen her. We know there's like a past love interest there. Yeah. Unlike with whoever the heck Paris Carver is. Yeah, Paris wait, Carver. Wait, 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 wait. You're saying that Paris Carver should have been uh, somebody reprising a role? Yeah, could, possibly. We'll get to that. That's in the comments section. And she's in the movie for like not Five very minutes. long. Yeah. She's in the movie. She shows up. She has a sex scene with Bond. And literally, there's an innuendo about Bond pumping her for information. My, you know my favorite line. Yeah. Pump her for information. Pumping chicks pump for a, information. Pump her for information. <laughs> and he pumps her for information. That's what spies do. M kind of calls him out for being a misogynist in Goldeneye. And then he's like, go pump her for information yeah. in this movie. <laughs> pump her for information is like my favorite line ever. I've referenced it. Every episode I reference it oh because it is so spy-esque. It's what they do. It's what they're trained to do. Speaking of uh, pumping for information, though, I do really appreciate the fact that that briefing scene takes place in a car. That was cool. It adds a sense of urgency because the whole thing yeah. is that, you know, you have 48 hours to investigate. Yeah. Investigate. I went on and on and on last episode about the whole we, we're getting away from Bond walks into the office, Money Penny sitting at the desk, he goes through the double door, briefed by M. Now we're kind of more in modern movies where it's different every time it's a little unique and it was fun in the past where they were they were always mixing up how bond got his hat on the rack it was cute but it's done now and now it's like we can do whatever we want and so doing it in the car and you know like m sitting there sipping whiskey and and and, and like the, the car's like shaking the whole time and every, you know and they've got the motorcade with them it adds a sense of urgency we have two days to figure this out before world war three happens i was excited for that 48 hour ticking clock but it would have been nice if they referred to it throughout 
not all the time, but like reminded us, hey, like, we're running out of time. The movie hints at having some kind of deeper meaning about the media's tendency to misinform, put your hat on, um, but doesn't really flesh that out beyond Carver's party and maybe the suicide scene. Like it would have been interesting. Like Carver never started to really use his influence. Like he could have been planting more stories that were maybe messing up Bond, like, like just something. But instead, but that was the things I liked. I did like, like I do like the whole, you know, he comes back to find Paris, and then oh, you yeah, hear the news. news. It is with great sadness that we announce the death of Paris Carver, who has become an international figure since she became the wife of Elliot Carver. That was cool. That's the best that scene was of the something movie. That worked. Yeah, that works. That is my favorite scene of the movie. Um, mm -hmm. but like, and, but that's just, that's just touching on the idea that Carver can mess these people up with his, with his media. Right. But nothing ever comes of it because Bond just gets yeah. out of the situation. And that's a lot of what happens. A lot of what happens in this movie is, Hey, it's going to go this way. And then, and then we just throw it out. Remember back in live and let die where they, uh, uh, jive cab driver takes Bond and they take him to the airport and, it, and he's, he like, he's like, you go on. No, because he is. He's the jive ass uh, cab driver. And he's like, he's like, hey, Jim, you going skydiving. And it's like, oh, wow. How's Bond going to get out of the situation? Bond throws a punch and runs away. And then with this, Stamper is going to take two days to slowly take you to pieces. <laughs> and Bond's like, no. And he just throws a punch and, he, and runs away. It's like, yeah, you thought the movie was going to go in maybe a cool direction. Like, how is Bond going to get out of this? Oh, he just throws a punch and grabs a gun and jumps out the window. It's just, it's, it's that same level of like, you think every time you think something intelligent might happen, it just turns on another big dumb action scene. And again, <laughs> part of your brain's like, well, it's kind of cool when they go down the banner. But like, I was kind of <laughs> looking forward to something smarter there. To be fair, they do set that up. An actual torture scene would have been nice, though. <laughs> I mean, yeah, an actual torture scene would have been nice, but we kind of already, I feel like they were like, well, we already did that when we were at Carver's headquarters where all the old guys are being... <laughs> that, was, that was the thing that I also noted, was that, like, why is Carver's... Why is, like, half of Carver's inchmen are all, like, geriatrics? Because <laughs> they all come out. <laughs> They're all these old f***ing dudes that are just, like... <laughs> <laughs> baseball bats because old yeah. people are who They're usually old fall victim to fake news Exa yeah. oh, there we go there we go because <laughs> like even when even when they're trying to get into Bond's BMW mind you again we haven't even touched about the fact that this movie is a giant commercial for BMW and Avis including the motorbike yeah but then like yeah when they're trying to get into the BMW which Nans, as as far as Bond cars, where would you rank the BMW? I like the gadgets, but the car itself is a lame vehicle. Exactly. It's a nice vehicle, but it's like something you would see a dad driving around. You're like, cool. <laughs> I, I, he's got a BMW. Or Not 7 Series sedan a, BMW. A, a 750. I had a 7 Series <laughs> when I was in high school, and it was some beat up piece of junk that I drove around. <laughs> And thought I was James Bond, and obviously I was not. But yes, geriatrics <laughs> and try to get into the car. <laughs> I wonder if, you know, when it says select the security the level, level, back in Fear Eyes Only, did he choose 10 out of 10, and that's why the car fucking <laughs> exploded when they broke a window? <laughs> You know, versus with this, it's like the car's a little smarter in that sense. With that scene in general, though, I mean, it it goes back to guilty pleasure. It's a cool scene. It's fun. It I, is fun. Again, I, I agree. I am serious. It's like we're remote control cars. Were they really big in 97? And so they're like, we got to get remote controls in there. You know, video <laughs> games, cell phones. We had talked about, uh, you know, back a long time ago when we talked about You Only Live Twice. And I had mentioned, you know, like the fact that the rocket in that movie is like, that's the thing we have today is the rockets that like land. Oh, yeah. Some more Elon technology. In this Which movie. is so, yeah, exactly. And then this movie, you have something that cars are now being able to do now with Smart Pack, and I love that commercial. Smart Pack. Summon mode. Detect the car, please. Detect the Volkswagen. Okay, all right, it's correcting itself. Nice. Hey. Even something as simple as remote start. Exactly. Yeah. The guys are like, whoa, how's this car starting? And like, that's just normal that's now. That's something normal now. Like people have, you know, like our, our phones can do 
crazy things that probably like the Bond phone could not do, of course. Yeah. I mean, you can Bond control. Bond obviously plays a lot of video games to be able to just pick up that <laughs> yeah. cell phone and he played, right you know, he was games. playing GoldenEye Rogue, you know, he's playing GoldenEye 64. Angry Birds. But it's just cool. Like, I, I do think that's like the one thing in this movie that I'm like, we kind of have that now. It's kind of cool. So going back to the rank, it is. <sighs> Do you think it could penetrate Thunderball? Like, I have a hard time penetrating Thunderball because Thunderball still manages to have our Connery coolness, whereas this just has our... This just always opts for, like, what do we do? Action scene. What do we do? How do we fill 20 minutes? Action scene. Thunderball's action is motivated and yeah. it doesn't seem desperate for filler. This movie just feels desperate for filler. I could see it above Octopussy in terms of straightforward plot that isn't confusing and stupid and all that and having, you know, these fun bad guys again like Dr. Kaufman could Dr. Kaufman alone could elevate it above Octopussy, but I don't know if it penetrates that conneriness of Thunderball. Yeah. Pierce Brosnan in a tank could bust through the wall that is Goldfinger, but I don't think him on a Beamer motorcycle <laughs> gets through Thunderball. That's a good way to put I think, it. Yeah. I, yeah, Charlie, I just think even though... It jumps over Octopus. Even though Thunderball has all these plot conveniences, I just think it's just a classier movie overall. It's a little bit more of a smarter big dumb action movie, I think. We actually get scenes with the characters and understanding their motives. But like I said before, it really feels like they were trying to take the Blofeld skin and put it over something of today to make it work. Thunderball doesn't do that. It's just a giant criminal organization. Yeah. And we're in the midst of the Cold War. And like, that's really all you need to know. Like, there's not it, there's nothing we're hiding here. This movie is trying to make an excuse for being outdated. So to do that, we throw this news angle in it's like these are the real super villains of today is the news corporations cartoony character give me my tinfoil hat you know that kind of bullshit yeah. and it's just like that's why i don't think it's better than thunderball like carver himself said the key to any good story is not who or what or when but why but why and what is the why of this movie? And I think that, like I said, I think Carver's motivation is muddy. Yeah. Whereas Spectre's why is just the their name, name of the Spectre. Yeah, exactly. S special executive for counterintelligence, um, revenge. terrorism, revenge, and extortion. And yeah. they're trying to extort uh, like a hundred million pounds or something. Oh, hell, let's just do what we always do hijack some nuclear weapons and hold the world hostage. Yeah. Good. Pretty it's simple. Like Largo pretty is clear. a big dumb asshole, but Blofeld is there doing his thing. Bond goes to Nasha and does his detective thing, and you got Domino there. Like it, it certainly has more class than this big dumb action movie that I enjoy. There's something about Tomorrow Never Dies that I've always really enjoyed. I never fight. I never protest putting <laughs> it on. Because it no, it's is... a movie that's easy to watch. It's definitely yes. and like my first reaction watching it is just like, oh, this is middle of the list. And I only yeah. say that because like while it does, it has a lot of shortcomings where it doesn't have either personal stakes or just that hint of class that the other films have. It's still like it's still fun to watch. Like I just yeah. still love watching it like any time. So let's just summarize real quick. Let's start from the bottom. Come with me, Mr. Bond. Definitely going to be better than You Only Live Twice. Diamonds yeah. Are Forever, we all know it's good fun. That movie's shameless. This movie's kind of shameless, but it's kind of what McCurdy was saying. It it's is serious, coherent sure. and <laughs> easily followed. So, it, and, and it's like, it doesn't have... That's a big Like, benefit. okay, <laughs> subtract, like, take your, your average Bond movie, and instead of having goofy sh stupid and goofy sh you have big dumb action movie sh So you have Bond with a gun, and he's like... Brrr, like, do you notice those There's moments where he's like, he's like spinning the, you know, and, and they're like, Way Lin does it too. They're both you know. dual wielding guns. And I was yeah. like, is this when like video games added dual wielding? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Moonraker. Yes. Live and Let Die is still just chase scenes and assassinations and fun henchmen yeah. and fart deaths to me. <laughs> uh, the Living Daylights, as usual, Dalton's great and all that, but Bond, who sleeps with women, flirts with Money Penny, and sits around in hotel rooms getting drunk while he waits for bad guys is so much better than the one-woman Bond of The Living Daylights, which overall is still just hard to give a shit about. Dalton, 
cool, Dalton, great, top five, but <laughs> just still the movie overall lacking. Octopussy, even with its convoluted plot and clownery, it's entertaining. It's got some stupid stuff. It never becomes a big dumb action movie like this, but it does have stupid goofy stuff. Sit. The romance with Octopussy, as much as there could have been more there, as we talked about in that episode, it certainly is better than this Paris stuff and certainly better than the Wei Lin stuff. The train sequence is just solid. A simple dinner scene with Kamala Khan is a nice touch next to Carver's info dumps. Again, I just I would have loved to just sit and hang out with Carver for five minutes. I could see Tomorrow Never Dies going above it, though, because at least Tomorrow Never Dies is clear in its plot, and the bad guy has a more understandable motivation than Khan. Khan had no motivation. Tomorrow Never Dies is just too much of a big dumb action movie to trump Thunderball's action. Like, Thunderball's action is classy. Tomorrow Never Dies, I could cut every action scene in half, and oh, the yeah. movie would yeah. be better for Especially it. Especially the motorcycle one. Yeah, goes and long. there are things with <laughs> Thunderball, though. If we go back to talking about Thunderball, it's like... Uh, it was the inconvenient the plot inconveniences that like riddled throughout the movie like yeah. oh let's go to let's go to Nassau because his his hot Nassau. sister's there and you're like okay but at least we get like this really straightforward kind of investigation piece and you know like uh, Fiona's really great you know she's a really good uh terrible villain death. In the, terrible death great villain even though Largo is kind of a crap villain being the number two and kind of being short-sighted I do kind of like how he, you know, he's intertwined a little bit better with the Bond girl in that film versus this one. Speaking of plot conveniences, how does Wei Lin find the boat? How does she find it? We never know. I don't think it's information we need to know. Wait, what do you mean? So Bond goes to the U.S. with a GPS decoder, whatever yeah. thing, to yeah. figure out where the ship sank. And she's in the boat when he gets there. So it's like, how does she know where it is? No, that makes actually a lot of sense. She's from China. The Chinese MiGs would have had the information as to find out where it is because they think they're in international waters and the MiGs don't think so. So she, oh, she could have gone yeah. off the information of the sense. MiGs versus the... if I'm, the if Chinese I have that, army on. is saying, hey, you're too close to us. So they know if, where they're at. Yes. Better question is not how did she find it? Because from what you guys just said, of course she found it. The better question is, why didn't they check it out sooner? Yeah. <laughs> Big dumb action movie. That's all you need to know. Titties. Titties. That's all you so, need to know. <laughs> but, like I said, I could I could maybe now be persuaded to say it's not as good as Octopussy. It's tough, right? Because it's like on one hand, you have stupid, goofy Roger Moore. Shit, but like the train sequence is cool. And then here you have big dumb action movie. It's hard to compare those. I think I prefer dumb action to. Yeah, I'm probably going to say Tomorrow Never Dies. So I, I am on board <laughs> with it being number 12. Even though Octopussy, I think, excels in some of those more particular moments where like you have better romance. Even though Elliot Carver, like you said, is a cartoon. Going back to Octopussy, Michael G. Wilson couldn't decide who the villain was. So he just takes Kamala Khan and Russian guy okay. and he's like, they're <laughs> the villains and it's two villains and it's not very concise as to who who should be the main bad guy. And it's supposed to be kind of this weird partnership where like this movie, even though they're like, well, General Chang and we only see General Chang like in one scene in this yeah, whole damn movie he just walks by and they talk yeah. about him a lot. They're like, oh, General Chang. At least at the end of the day, we're like, okay, Carver's the bad guy. Like, we get it. When it comes down to the the henchmen, right, where, you know, an octopusy, you had Mishka and Grishka, and they're fun and all and that. And the saw and blade you, you guy got, and yo-yo guy. Yeah, you got some, you got some <laughs> yo -yo wacky stuff going on. I am such a fan of Dr. Kaufman. My name is Dr. Kaufman. I am an outstanding pistol marksman. Take my word for it, yeah? The guy is in one scene, and I wish he was in the whole movie, but that one scene is phenomenal. He's so much fun. He never goes, he's, you know, he's got his wacky accent and all that, and he's just like, he's <laughs> like, I'm the, I'm the best assassin on the planet. I'm awesome. But, like, he still manages to make you laugh. But now I'm afraid, Mr. Bond, that our little... Ah, Stumper! Stop yelling in my ear, yeah? Sir. 
they can't get into the car. He's like, you know, they're asking me to ask you to tell them how to get in the car. Yeah, he's <laughs> like, I'm, I'm like the most professional guy ever. Like he's he's about to kill Bond, and it's then like, Stamper's like, make him tell you how to open it. Oh, oh, okay, I ask. This is very embarrassing. It seems there's a red box in your car. They can't get to it. They want me to make you unlock the car. I feel like an idiot. I don't know what to say. I am to torture you if you don't do it. You have a doctorate in that too? <laughs> no, no, no. This is more like a hobby. But I'm very gifted. Oh, I believe you. And like my favorite line of that scene is, did you call the auto club? <laughs> it's like, <laughs> yeah, what the f are they going to do to get into this thing? Literally every line that comes out of the guy's mouth is just solid gold all the way up until his final line, which is, I'm just a professional doing a job. Me too. And then Bond gets that awesome killing line. And so you have this amazing assassin character who, if he was in a Roger Moore movie, he would probably have just been only funny and not really threatening at all. But he does ride that line of being funny and serious at the same time. And then that's coupled with this Pierce Brosnan performance of Below the Surface. He's boiling with rage. I'm shocked he didn't strangle the guy instead of just shooting him. By far the best scene of the movie. And then from there on, you just have Stamper, which is fine. He's like big, tough, Germanic looking. Bleach blonde hair. Looks like he goes to the 90s techno raves. He's he's he, in a mesh he looks shirt. like uh, he looks like Red Grant. He looks like Necros. No! When he got that role, apparently he had 30 seconds to like introduce himself and he just <laughs> said, "I'm big, bad and German." And they were like, "Here's the role." Like they that's just funny. Off yeah, of that. that's great. My art is in great demand, Mr. Bond. I go all over the world. I am especially good at the celebrity overdose. I heard that and I was like, damn, that does not <laughs> age well. Like it ages, it well, no, ages no, no. well. It, it's, it's, it it's ages great. ages well. Okay, because you said before, how is it that Elliot Carver is in contact with these people? And it's like, Elliot Carver has shown he's a guy who's willing to manipulate real world events so that he can report he on creates them. creates the news. So like, go kill a celebrity, have Dr. Kaufman go kill a celebrity, and then you can sell a ton of newspapers from it. That whole scene is great. And then even just down to Bond walks in, the tape is playing, talking about Paris being dead, and then- A body was discovered along with the body of an unidentified man who appeared to be the victim of a self-inflicted gun wound. It won't look like a suicide if you shoot me from over there. I am a professor of forensic medicine. Believe me, Mr. Bond, I could shoot you from Stuttgart and still create the proper effect. And speaking of Red Grant, the plan to murder-suicide Bond is pretty reminiscent of the murder-suicide plot out of From Russia With Love. It must be a pretty sick collection of minds to dream up a plan like that. That scene is great. I wish we had more scenes like that in this movie. That scene is very smart. But instead, we just get... You know, our, our fun popcorn eating, big dumb action scenes. It is the opposite of Goldeneye, where it's just, it's meaningless. I'm pretty comfortable with Below Thunderbolt. Quirty Manor, up first, has the first one word review we've seen in the comments section yet. Oh my God. Which is, da da da, meh. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think he's wrong. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't yeah. think he's wrong. I enjoy the movie. It's meh. It's all right. The comments pretty much always average out, right? There's always some kind of like median with the comments. Yeah. And this one is middle of the road. As McCurdy said early on, it's the middle of the road. Blastoise, old Ethan Toys Blastoise. Ethan Blastoise Toys. Blastoise. Ha ha ha. Blastoise. Yeah, we didn't have Scott to laugh. <laughs> Blastoise. Who Blastoise cares? says hydro it, pumps. The dog. <laughs> <laughs> His name is Blastoise? Ha 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 ha. Anyway. <laughs> uh, yeah, Blastoise, who we, we flung a lot of shit at last time, but. Uh, For no reason. But like no this reason. time, this time I think we'll, we'll somewhat agree with him. But yeah. in the reverse. Currently dead last on my ranking, the Michael okay. Bay of Bonds. Throw enough crappy editing and explosions and the audience will be too distracted to realize it sucks. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Ugly economy car. If the point was to be inconspicuous, that failed miserably. 
and Chase yeah. in an ugly parking garage. Worst villain, what an annoying asshole. The <laughs> magician they cut out who threw razor cards would have been cool. Oh, well. I know nothing about that, but... Didn't look Henry it up. Henry Gupta. Henry Gupta, the IT guy, is a magician that's good at throwing cards. Uh, and there were scenes that they cut where he, like, throws cards, I guess. I wait, are you serious? Gupta did that? Yeah. That would be cool. What? Back, back up, back up. Okay. Back up. Back up. So we were talking about the BMW. I'm confused. He said it doesn't blend in, but it perfectly blends in. No, no, no. I think what he's saying, I I, kind of disagree with him. Like, I like the idea of the car chase taking place within a parking garage. It's kind of fun and different. I think it's fine. I think for now, I don't think there were very many car chases that took place in parking garages. Tell me if I'm wrong, but I think that was kind of the first time we kind of saw that kind of thing. Like, yeah. Now we see in like the dark night, there's the scene that takes place in a parking garage and sure, there's probably other ones, but that one in particular, I'm like, no, I think it was kind of new for the time. I thought it was fun. I never think twice about it. Yeah. He's got to get out of the parking garage. He's stuck in the parking garage. It's kind of fun. But I think the funniest part of this movie as I watch it every f***ing time is he parks like an asshole. He doesn't park uh, in the lines. Yeah. Every yeah, time I like, watch this movie. He's in like two spots maybe more. He's just like, he's just such a rush. He just parks his car and I'm just thinking like, man, if I was looking for a parking spot right now and that car Typical was there, BMW I'd be so owner. pissed. Yeah. He's so pissed. Well, it's interesting that, you know, that the interesting part of the scene is that Bond, you know, Bond's sitting there like, I have to get in the car and then I have to escape. Right. So yeah. it's cool that he jumps in the car and then he's in the back seat, which is new. But he gets his MacGuffin, which as a side note, this MacGuffin is an interesting MacGuffin because we actually see it do stuff. So it's not like the Lecter. Mm-hmm. We never see the Lecter in action. This, no. the decoder, we actually see it in action. So it's a pretty cool MacGuffin. And then he jumps out and then James Bond does such an awkward thing. He does have bouts of hardcore property destruction property destruction definitely and in the last movie in golden i made the joke about him driving down that alley in saint petersburg and he might be killing a ton of people but before he does it he's like oh shit. like he reacts like oh god in this he's laughing as he almost kills a bunch of people he throws his car over a populated street not knowing that there's not going to be like some old woman on a scooter who's like oh glory as this car slams into her and then goes into the front of an avis congratulations on a safe journey That is such a movie moment. That's not a James Bond moment. That's that's just a movie moment of Bond doing something so crazily irresponsible. I mean, again, destroying St. Petersburg in a tank. Well, he had to do that for the interests of Queen and Country. He didn't have to <laughs> drive a car off a parking garage and almost kill a bunch of people. He didn't have to do that. But he did it for a laugh. Like, what the f*** is that? Again, big dumb action movie. I I, I will say this, though, about that sequence. You can tell, for whatever reason, Brosnan's having the time of his life. He's having so much fun. We talked before about how Pierce Brosnan is kind of a Bond nerd, and then he gets to play Bond. And so it it must be really cool to be standing there with Desmond Llewellyn and, you know, be like, you were in Goldfinger. You know, like... yeah. Like, like you said, he's having fun. He's clearly having he's fun. He's having a blast. He's not questioning that this is a big, dumb action movie. He's he like, don't care. Oh, he's whatever. like, I'm James Bond. Who cares, I'm laying man. in bed with this bombshell, <laughs> this blonde bombshell Danish chick. I don't give a f- you know? It's not my favorite car sequence by any means. Like, I still think the Spy Who Loved Me might be one of my favorite super spy car sequences. It's a fun little commercial if you're like, you know, if you're like trying to sell BMWs to <laughs> to people who are going to watch this movie because I bet you they sold a lot of BMWs after this movie. Yeah. The stinger going through the windshield and out the back windshield is, you know, like that's cool. I just laughed that that guy has a stinger missile. <laughs> yeah, right. I do agree with Blastoise in that, like we said earlier, the car is kind of like, that's the Bond car. Is yeah. <laughs> we get cooler BMWs later. BMW yeah. 750. That's the Bond car. Like the last movie, we had a really kind of really cool sports car. We didn't see it do anything cool, but we had a really cool Z3, sports car. This movie is a movie that every businessman probably owns. 
exactly. even today. You know, oh, yeah. you're just kind of like, eh. But anyway, so um, he says, uh, Maylin, not Waylin. Maylin is wooden. Her kung fu is show offy and useless when Bond can just as easily tap people on the shoulder and punch them when they turn around. Boring despite being one of the shortest. Yes, I think it's worse than that one. I think he's talking about Quantum. That had better car chase, better villains, better girls, better locales, better everything. Sounds like we have Scott back. (laughs) (laughs) No, I, I, I agree with him in this saying that like the with her acting, it's funny because like they made a huge thing about how like you know she was Brosnan's like oh she's so great she's so great <laughs> pathetic best part is the surrender song they didn't use and the, the David surrender Arnold songs score. The, the one at the end that David yeah. Arnold wrote that's the surrender song yeah so I I see his points but I don't I, I don't I don't judge the movie that harshly I'm like yeah yeah it's I get what he's saying he is 100% correct about it being the Michael Bay movie yeah. of the Bond series but yeah. like oh yeah but, like, I still don't hate it for that. Murphy Chase says, I think Tomorrow Never Dies is solid. There's nothing about it that really doesn't work. But besides some good action scenes and Carver being a cool villain, it really doesn't stand out when looking at most of the other films in the series. It's a very enjoyable film, but I would personally put it somewhere in the middle. So a couple med- middles and a bottom. Very middle yeah, of the road. another middle of the road. I, I agree. I, I, I don't necessarily think Carver's interesting... But like you and I, he's were interesting, he's, he's but a, he's not fully fleshed out. And he's a cartoon. He's, he's a yes, cartoon. He's another one of these bad guys that could have been a lot better, but he's just kind of muddied down by like, what is his why? Why? What is his motivation? K1 says on the subject of Tomorrow Never Dies, totally serviceable. Terry, Th- Terry Thatcher, Terry Hatcher was wasted and should have been Carrie Lowell reprising Pam Bovier, so I actually cared when she dies. That's what you were saying before, Nans. It should have been somebody pre-established so that we could care a little bit more, which is, which is a good note. I love the Dr. Kaufman scene. Yeah. And the action is great. Yeah, big dumb action movie. But the plot where the media is manipulating everyone on Earth to tear each other apart while they sit back and film the chaos is just too far-fetched. No! (laughs) No! Put your f***ing tinfoil hat on! Jesus Christ! No! Or as uh, Stamper would say, Nine! Nine! (laughs) F***ing nine! (laughs) Jesus Christ! Go to a commercial! Let him speak! that son of a... I'm not sitting here saying the news is manufactured like Carver's, but a story about the news spinning the facts to drive public opinion one way or another, and this stirring up war or riots or whatever is not far-fetched. It's been happening since the dawn of time. All people need to have a certain amount of media literacy so that there's just enough skepticism to not be completely misled by people behind the scenes that you don't know. But unfortunately, there will always be those people who believe everything they see on TV. And again, it's nothing new. But don't take my word for it. Let's see what Remington Steele had to say back in the 80s. We have this magical tool called television this tool of light and sound an instrument that can help create the most informed people in the world in the world's most enlightened republic instead we give you spotlight news we put on happy faces and happy talk we serve up wars and disasters like mealtime snacks we snicker we prattle we pander Spotlight news is not a local disgrace, it's a national affliction. We who sit in these well-salaried seats are not the news. Forget our polished smiles, our script that batter and our pretty faces, we are not the news. The news is unexpected, it's, it, it's hard and ugly, and most of all, it's complex. Don't settle for us, people. You're better than that. You deserve better. <laughs> but you heard me does that make sense i was gonna say is i think k1 uh, he has it wrong like like what he's describing as charlie's hot wet fantasy dream but the movie is is not that so the movie really isn't 
that necessarily it you touches can't, on this that. movie a movie about a guy heading up a, a, a corrupt media empire will that's like an eternal that'll always trope. be in something that'll but always I'm saying be that relevant the plot of the movie isn't exactly what you were saying like what he is saying it's like that's not exactly the plot or the villain's motivations or his plan that's not really what it is yeah carver does a lot more than just plant news stories he's right there the whole time directly affecting things fire one missile at the flagship of each fleet the chinese will think the british are rattling the saber the british will think the chinese are being belligerent in precisely five minutes after your countrymen have attacked the british fleet i shall retaliate for dear old england by sending this missile into Beijing. And he does all this specifically for the broadcasting rights, not just to manipulate, stir up trouble, and tear the world apart. Tomorrow Never Dies is the epitome of middle of the list. Bond, better than Thunderball, but worse than for your eyes only. So, middle of the road. Middle of the I road I kind of lean towards, like, middle low. Yeah. Not middle high, middle low. I'm happy with below Thunderball, above Octopussy. McCurds? Uh, I'm uh, I'm gonna agree with that. I'm gonna stay with that. Okay, below Thunderball, above Octopussy. Yeah. Okay. So number twelve. It is a guilty pleasure. It is a big dumb action movie. Yes, Blastoise. It is the Michael Bay movie of this yeah. series. Ah, uh, but like, <laughs> it's sleek and cool and stupid. <laughs> it gets. <laughs> I, I, I think where we have it on the list is a is perfect golden eyes still at number one goldfinger from rush with love license to kill the spy who loved me the man with the golden gun dr no a view to a kill for your eyes only honor majesty's secret service thunderball velkomen uh, I wish I knew more German. Welcome in tomorrow, never die, son. Yeah, to number 12. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Octopussy, The Living Daylights, Live and Let Die, Moonraker, Diamonds Are Forever, You Only Live Twice. Someday we'll get you out from the bottom. Maybe soon. Big dumb action movie. It's not like a horrible disappointment after GoldenEye. It's no. like, like I said, it's a return to the Roger Moore era. What do we do? We just made a shit ton of money. Uh, and, and we already milked everything about post-Cold War. What do we do? Let's go back to Roger Moore, baby. Jokes, tits, f***ing, <laughs> and a big megalomaniacal media mogul, bitch. This will be a conversation that maybe we go into when we start talking about the Craig movies. But I feel like this was a good choice for the Brosnan films, because if you think about it, we did a deconstruction of James Bond in our last movie, and that was a hit. I think it makes sense to go... From deconstruction to something that's a little more run of the mill. Safe. Something safe. Safe, save the cat kind of like, what's the fun of games of James Bond? Tits and action. Like, that's what yeah. you should do because if Gadgets, you do it. In, jokes. Because if you do it in TNA, Craig, if you think about it in the Daniel Craig movies, they don't do that. Megalomaniacal butthead bad guy who's right, way over the down. top. Calm down. <laughs> More but, titties. But when you do Daniel Craig's movies, Chinese I feel like people. they do. Can you shut up for five seconds? <laughs> God, you're worse than Scott. Um, <laughs> Somebody's got to pull the Scott card here. But when you do it with Daniel Craig, when we see shut in the future. Shut the f up, McCurdy. <laughs> you want to hear my opinion, McCurdy? Shut should, the f up. Let's just do James Bond movie. Like, nothing special, no fancy bells and whistles. Like, we're not doing another. Honor Matches Secret Service style film. This is just typical James Bond. Go investigate some crazy stuff in, uh, you know, into the world domination kind of hijinks. And like, it works. It's fun. It definitely has its shortcomings, but it could be better. But it's good. It's fun. Not investigate. 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 Anyway, so last movie. We toasted to Cubby because it was. It was his, he was still alive when they were making it, but it was kind of, uh, kind of his last one. This one, though, when credits roll, they have a little in memoriam for Cubby. Now, this being their first movie solo without Cubby alongside, we figured it was appropriate to toast to those who have now officially inherited the franchise. Michael G. Wilson and his 
half sister, right? I believe that. Yeah, I think Robert that's Broccoli. Correct. I think that's correct. <laughs> and this kind of also goes to show that the James Bond franchise has always been like a family franchise, and the fact that like it's been a family business that's been putting these movies out, not so much just big giant news corporations that want CDs and films and movies and television show series and all this other stuff, you know. So yeah. here's to the producers of these movies. Michael G. Wilson, Jeez. we should probably be broccoli. Doing shots of Smirnoff, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Cheers. Continued success with Zebond. You know, if you're that guy from CNN who was jerking off on camera. <laughs> is this new? What is that? Months ago, and they let him go and. Should have just killed himself. <laughs> so pretty funny. I work at CNN. <laughs> just kill me. Anyway. Yeah. Welcome back to Ranked. Oh, wait, wait, I'm wait, wait, Charles. Wait. I am not recording audio. Oh! Hey, you're lucky I caught it. <laughs>